Hello there, everybody. So today we're going to talk about the Irish potato famine. And as I have here, it could be the genocide you've never heard of. Let's hop right in. So the relationship between Britain and Ireland, of course, really started to change a little bit for the different. And uh, when Oliver Cromwell sent forces to start to occupy part of Ireland, and then slowly but surely, Ireland came under more control of the British. Um, most people that were living in Ireland during that period, I would say all the way up into 1801, which I'll talk about, um, slowly but surely the land was controlled by almost all of the English, um, and the English also kind of view the Irish as like a different race of people, and I'm going to get into that, and there's going to be some pretty brutal discrimination here. Um, this is going to be important, something to follow as I go along, but finally in 1801, Ireland is officially made a member of the United Kingdom. And in general, a Lord Lieutenant of Ireland is appointed by the British government to run that territory of theirs. Um, they did get to send some representatives to the House of Commons and Lords. However, all of these were either landowners, of which there were few, and Protestant, okay, which were the vast minority of the population within Ireland. So not a whole heck of a lot of rights. And it was actually pretty much even worse. Um, not only the Irish looked down upon, but Irish Catholics particularly were worked down were looked down upon quite a bit. So Catholics were basically prevented from doing like literally almost everything. Uh, for mo much of its history um, until 1829, which I have down there, which we'll get to, um, they could not purchase or lease land. They couldn't vote. They couldn't hold political office. They couldn't obtain an education. There were lots of um, jobs that they were not permitted to get into, particular government jobs, and almost uh, all of them, here was something crazy, if the British had an incorporated town in Ireland, people who were Irish Catholics could not live within five miles of the town. Um, it was crazy. Now, as time went on, they start to change some things. One of the big ones was when they allow the Irish to build churches again. For a while, they weren't even allowed to build churches. And so you see a picture there on the left of, of a Irish Catholic Church. But then you're finally going to get a change because there was potential for, and, and I'm sorry, the change isn't necessarily because of an equal rights thing by absolutely no means. The English Parliament looked at what was going on in Ireland. There was a lot of poverty. There were a lot of angry people. And so they decide to finally kind of give in a little bit to some pressure, and they're going to pass the Roman Catholic Relief, Relief Act of 1829. Um, now, the prime minister at the time was a guy by the name of the Duke of Wellington. You might have remember him from back in our Napoleon days. But the other guy that kind of helped push this law through was Robert Peel, who would, uh, who you see pictured here, who will eventually become the prime minister as well. And so in the Roman Catholic Relief Act, you had a variety of things. Pretty much all of those previous restrictions were lifted, as well as um, Irish Catholics, or Catholics in general, were actually permitted to enter Parliament. And that's a big deal because, again, there were also a number of Catholics in England itself. And so this is a big deal. This, this is known as Catholic emancipation, okay? However, there is a catch, okay? There are two big issues that still come out of that. And don't get me wrong, all that stuff, you know, lifting all those restrictions is huge. However, in order to make sure not too many Irish can vote, they increase property requirements to vote. If you remember, we've talked about this a lot. England had property requirements to vote. And so that is going to reduce the amount of the electorate from Ireland, as well as the Irish were still required to give 10% of their wealth to the Anglican church uh, in the form of a tithe. So you're also having to pay for a church that isn't yours. And so that is problematic as well. However, the big issue was the land issue, okay? So 80% of the population in Ireland is Catholic, okay? But they don't really own the land. Almost all the land was owned by the by British landowners or some Irish Protestant landowners. 
And but the vast majority were British, and they were absentee landlords. They didn't live in Ireland. They didn't stay in Ireland. What instead they did is that they used middlemen, and the middlemen were like local kind of property managers that would basically send back rents and you know any money or crops that needed to be sent off the land would go to those absentee landlords. The problem was is that one the peasants had to pay like a double rent, if you will. They had to pay rents to live on any land. So no Irishman, think about this, no Irishman actually owned their own home for the most part. All right, this is absolutely crazy. And secondly, they were often paid specifically low wages to keep them in poverty. And I have here peasants abused. And, and one of the ways that they kept peasants in line is that there were no laws regulating like evictions and stuff like that. If you look at modern day, like you can't get kicked out of your home if you pay rent and all, if you're renting, if you pay rent or if you pay a mortgage and whatever. Like in this case, like they could get kicked off their home for whatever reason. The rents could get bumped up. If I don't like you, I can massively increase your rent real quick and then get rid of you and then drop the rent for somebody else that I want to be in there. I mean, to be an Irish peasant and then you work this land tremendously um, really for the benefit of only the British. Because as we're going to see, and I'm going to mention a number of times, most of the food that is grown in Ireland is actually exported. The Irish don't even get to keep it or sell it because, they, again, they don't own the land. So there's no way for them to make some type of significant wage. But then the potato is introduced to Ireland. And this is pretty significant. This is a ma massive dietary and cultural shift. Um, when people think of Irish food, they think of potatoes, which is interesting because the potatoes are from the Americas. But... The, the potato becomes a crucial aspect of Irish life, okay? And that key potato was the Irish lumper. Um, this is incredibly important, okay? This becomes the key thing of what the Irish diet is based off of. Most people ate up to 12 pounds of potatoes per day. And the Irish lumper in general, plus one other kind of potato that they used, um, the benefits of these potatoes, I mean, they have lots of nutrients. They were very calorie dense and they could survive the winter. So, I mean, and, and they're pretty, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can make potatoes. And so this is a really great thing. Um, the other thing is because of their low wages, this is the one thing that they can, uh, you know, that they can afford because other crops like cereal grains or certain vegetables, um, the Irish didn't have enough money for that because of their deliberately um, low wages. So this gives them an opportunity to get some food. And then this all changes in 1844. In 1844, a massive blight hits the Irish potato crops and causes a massive failure. And when I say massive failure, I'm talking about like a loss of like the entire potato crops across all of Ireland. Um, this is kind of like this, this fungus type thing. And what hurts is that there was a slight change in the weather in Ireland from about 1844 to 1850. And it just got a little bit cooler and it got a little bit wetter. And unfortunately, it was cool and wet conditions, which really allows this blight to spread. And as you can see here, uh, the potato is completely inedible. You cannot eat any of it. You can't eat anything that comes off of it. It will make you violently ill. Um, and the problem with that is that you can't get seed potatoes, so it compounds every year, and so you have less potatoes are grown each year, but even the potatoes that are grown, they all get keep getting hit. And pretty much every single potato crop from 1844 to 1849 was wiped out. It is catastrophic. And what you end up having is people, you know, a million plus people are starving, and they're starving to death death. Okay. And I'm going to talk about population issues later. Uh, the British response is, is pretty weak. Uh, prime minister, Robert Peel, he's there. We've talked about him before. Um, he is going to do, um, one thing and try to import corn from the Americas to help with food for the Irish. The problem is, is that food, that corn isn't that nutrient dense, which I'll get into again later. Um, so it really doesn't help much. And, and if you look at the picture on the right, this, this kind of really shows you, if you look at all these different places, you see this mother who is basically 
dying. You know, she's trying to, you know, breastfeed a baby, and you've got these two kids pulling on her for anything, but you can see she's basically passed out. You see a boy over here, he's trying to eat a shoe, and then if you look outside the window, you see a man cutting off bark to eat it. I mean, I know I kind of laugh there, but I laugh at the absurdity of all of this. I mean, but this gives you an idea of, like, how terrible a situation we were talking about here. All right, people eating bark, people eating shoes, it, it's catastrophic. Um, and it's going to get even worse. So Robert Peel and his government are, um, I believe in 1845, are out. It could be 1845, 1846. Uh, and a new party comes into power, the Whig Party. And the Whig Party was very anti-Ireland in general, but they will look at what's going on and they will take a laissez-faire attitude toward it. They feel that because of everything that's going on, that government intervention um, isn't needed because prices for food and stuff like that will just generally drop, um, which in this case doesn't happen. And, and sometimes there are natural things that where you don't necessarily need the government to intervene because, you know, these things happen and over time it'll fix itself. But in this particular case, this is such a shock that the, the, that doesn't work. You need government intervention here. But again, you still have discrimination that is evident in, in and in no other way can we really see this in Charles Trevelyan, okay, this guy on the on the left. This is a man who was put in charge of Irish food relief, okay? His job was to fix that. And he specifically was quoted as saying that the judgment of God sent the calamity to teach the Irish a lesson. So right there, I mean, is this guy going to really work hard to help these people out? Doubtful. And we also have more land issues. There was a reliance on landowners, and the idea was that the British landowners would help their tenants, and it, it just doesn't happen. Um, because of all the crop issues and how hungry people are, they're not working as much, they're not paying, paying money, so they don't have rent. And so what ends up happening is that the, the British landlords end up just like kicking people out and so you have this starved population, and now we have massive amounts of people being kicked out of their homes as well. Um, and what's even more frustrating about this is in the future, um, the British will allow any land that had debts on it. So some of these British landowners would go into debt because they weren't getting rents. And so the British government would pass a law to allow other people to basically buy up the land at much lower prices. Um, and then what they do after that is that they continue to evict people because they want to put their own people on the land. Um, and so even after the potato blight and the potato famine is over, you have 50,000 families are removed from homes that are bought uh, from money used by people to gobble up the land and, and you know, speculators doing that after the famine is over. So it's like even when the famine is over, it's, it's, it's not even over. Um, they do set up some soup kitchens and you think, okay, cool. They're going to feed people. All right. But again, they don't really feed people. They just kind of give them cornmeal gruel. And again, as I mentioned, corn isn't good by itself. Um, the Maya didn't eat corn by itself. They mixed it with lime and other ingredients that would bring out more of the nutrients of corn. If you just use corn meal, that's not good enough. It might fill your belly for a little while, but you're still going to deteriorate because you're not getting the nutrients that you need. So this isn't even helpful. Now, many people do argue that this is a genocide, and there's some pretty strong points on that. You know, the people that would say it's not genocide is that they did set up soup kitchens. Uh, I'm going to talk about the charitable groups that were allowed to go into Ireland and the money that was raised to try to help the Irish, a lot of it from many different areas, so I'm going to be talking about that. So, you know, to say that the British did nothing isn't fair, but some uh, there's going to be a couple practices here that really speaks to the fact that whereas they didn't plan this, okay, there's no evidence that the, the British did this blight on purpose. So one of the key things of a genocide is that, you know, it's planned, it's organized, and then carried out. So that part we don't have here, but it was the deliberate responses by the British after the potato blight hits that can be construed as genocide in a way. 
So first and foremost, you have the attitude. And that's the big thing. You know, this idea, one of the reasons of, you know, one of the arguments of genocide is discrimination against a group. And as you can see here, um, and I'm going to explain some of these pictures in a little bit, um, British intellectuals, and some of whom were in Parliament, really argued against any intervention, uh, mainly because they felt that there were too many Irish and that this was a natural event and that this was a way to kind of call the Irish population because that's what needed to happen. Um, of course, you have the religious issue and that many people, uh, you had discrimination against Catholics. And then there was this racial issue. Okay. And this is a big deal because the British really, um, especially through propaganda, would routinely refer to the Irish as a, like a different race of people. Okay. And if you remember, and we'll kind of mention this a little bit before, in the 1800s, it was very big to, you know, depict what is a good-looking person and what isn't a person, and often to using the ideas of Darwin not correctly is that they look at different, they being typically white Europeans, will relate Africans and the Irish to looking more ape-like in appearance to show them as a less evolved form of human. And so as you see here in this drawing, you have Negroes and Irish Iberians, so the Spanish kind of throw get thrown in there as well, of uh, showing them as like a different race versus the Anglo-Europic. Um, and on the right here, you see this Irish woman that's embodying Ireland, like searching for independence. And look, they make her all masculine and brawny. And again, look at that ape-like face versus that wonderful prim, like, 20 inch waist there from uh, the, the Victorian woman and that's from 1878 so you can see that like this is a major issue and so discrimination plays a very large part in this but the biggest thing was the fact that while this entire potato famine went on and thousands and thousands and then up to a million people are going to die that they're going to export food the entire time meaning that Ireland had food, and they took the food out. Okay, now I have here precedent in the 1700s. In the 1700s, there were a couple small-scale famines in Ireland. And what did Britain do? They actually sent them food. And in one case, they actually shut down all exports of food from Ireland to feed the people. All right. And it's just awful. 1847 was the worst year. So listen to this. Listen to this. In 1847... 400,000 Irish will die from starvation. But during that time, the exports in calves, bacon, and ham, which were actually mostly from the, the counties that had the most people die of starvation, those exports were actually increased during that time. So again, they had the food there. Other things that they got out were really densely populated or, or densely or densely nutrient um, items like Peas, beans, onions, rabbits, salmon, oysters, herring, lard, honey, and clothing. And then any of the things that were left, there were deliberately price, deliberate price increases. And so when you look at this, it's hard to argue that this doesn't kind of morph into a genocide. That, yes, the way that it started was not quote-unquote genocidal. Okay, because there's no like rigging of a famine here, which we've seen in other places in the world, but, but there wasn't a deliberate causing of a famine. But when the famine was there, the fact that nothing was actually done is horrific. And in many cases, I think it's fair to then argue that it is indeed genocide. Um, you did have a lot of charity, though. Uh, there were many people in Britain that tried to help um, by sending money and developing charities. I mean, the British definitely jacked some of that money, so there's another argument for the genocide. Um, but you had large monetary donations from people all across the world. Um, some ones that I found most notable, Tsar, Tsar Alexander II, Pope Pius IX, uh, Queen Victoria herself from her own money, Sultan um, Abdulmasid I of the Ottoman Empire, Actually, James K. Polk and even Congressman Abraham Lincoln all donated money. Um, there was a big relief organization called the British Relief Association, which was um, 
founded by prominent European bankers. The Rothschilds were some of the biggest ones that pushed this. They actually raised 390,000 pounds for relief, you know, pounds as in British money. Um, and in the United States, upwards of $545,000 worth of goods were sent to Ireland as well. And so there were people that tried their best to help it, but it just wasn't enough. So in the end, the impact of, of the the populate the impact of the famine was was devastating. Um, first you look at population destruction, which they actually haven't even recovered from to this day. Um, you had about eight and a half eight million people in Ireland when the famine hit, and because of immigration and some other things, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, in 1921, you would only look at four million people. So over half of the population would be gone, and it would continue to reduce. Um, over one million people died from starvation and diseases like typhus and pneumonia. Also, two million people are going to flee for other countries, mostly the United States, as you see a picture there on the right. Um, nationalism is going to increase. Um, you're going to get a big push for Irish independence movements are going to come out. Uh, also, you're going to get the creation of the Irish Land League in 1879, which called for land reform so that people can actually get um, a fair shake and the possibility of trying to own their own land. Um, Charles Parnell is going to make a big move because he's actually going to be an Irish Catholic representative of parliament that's really going to push for the concept of home rule although that doesn't happen and you start to see the Irish will attack British positions or Protestant positions in Ireland, so it becomes much more aggressive. Um, William Gladstone, who's a prime minister I've talked about before, in both 1886 and 1893 will try to get um, home rule for the Irish. Um, it fails both times, but the big thing that I think you can say that comes out of the famine is this big burst in vigor of independence. Um, not that the Irish didn't want independence before, but because of the lack of action by the British during the famine, it made them realize that they needed to have their own country. And this is something that we're going to consistently see until after World War I when the Irish do finally gain their independence, okay? So I hope you guys learned a little bit, and we'll talk about this in class.